right, welcome back. Uh, ready to start the afternoon sessions with uh, a pair of gentlemen from Nordakademi Hochschule der Wirtschaft. First, we have uh, Mikhail Schultz. Uh, Mikhail is a professor of information systems, and uh, he earned his doctoral degree in business administration from Phillips University of Marburg. His area of expertise is databases and analytical information systems. His research interests include data mining, data modeling, and self-service business intelligence. <coughs> Uwe Neuhaus is a lecturer of computer science and research associate. He studied computer science at the Technical University of Braunschweig. His area of work comprises the design and analysis of algorithms, data science, and software development. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Michael and Uwe. We are very glad to be here. And uh, you introduce it already a little bit. Uh, we're from a small university uh, in northern Germany, and we have two campuses, one about 20 miles away from Hamburg, uh, and very nice, nicely located, uh, lots of trees, uh, lots of green, you can see it on the right. And we have also uh, a building uh, in, in very close to, to the river, uh, to the Elbe in Hamburg. Uh, we can, you can find it up here. Um, you were already introduced. Our background actually isn't really uh, sports analytics until now. Um, we are more from an information systems business analytics background. Uh, I come from a computer science, da uh, data science, data mining background. But we jointly um, give a lecture on analytical information systems, which applies pretty much the same methods that uh, you could use in sports analytics or that that I use in sport analytics to, uh, in the business context. For example, marketing, or uh, I myself, I, I, I did uh, some research in uh, um, diagnostics of uh, suitability uh, to find the right people for the right jobs, for example. But um, in our lecture, um, everybody agrees it's an important topic, but our <coughs> students find it challenging because the uh, methods we use are not, are not really simple. They are pretty mathematical and also the use cases we have come from from the business area and for students just beginning their study it's sometimes abstract they can't really relate to it and we thought we have to find something that uh, the students really like to analyze and that they, that they understand so, so we were looking for a use case out of their everyday life and ideally something they even can get passionate about Passionate, in Germans are not two words that usually use in the sentence. <coughs> we are very organized, uh, but uh, we usually have other traits. But there are like one or two uh, areas uh, where we are passionate, and one is soccer, which for some historical reason we call football. So. If I should use the word football, I mean soccer. <laughs> Just uh, that you were raised from, from, from early age and you always call it Fußball, which is football. <coughs> um, it's the major sport in Germany. Uh, in the United States you have many different sports. You have, you have baseball, you have, you have football, which we call American football. Um, you have ice hockey, you have basketball. In Germany you have soccer, 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 soccer. and. <laughs> Everybody, I would say, nearly every kid is playing soccer at, at some age. Um, most are doing it through the through the ages. We have, a, a, for example, a, um, the professors at the university meet sometimes and play soccer because it's a, <coughs> a nice activity. And even if you're not a soccer fan, you know soccer. You know the rules. You know the teams. So. Basically, everybody can relate to it, and we thought, okay, let's let's take soccer and apply our methods that we use, not in a business context, but in a soccer context. But you might uh, argue, well, we're not the first to do it, and, and that's true. Uh, for example, we have expert, uh, expert uh, evaluations after uh, a game, uh, people um, sit down and write grades for, for the different players. For example, these are uh, the players 
um, that participated in um, a tournament about one year ago, and you get grades. Uh, we have a grading system uh, that's similar to our grades in, in school, ranging from 1.0, which is the best grade, to uh, 6.0, which is the worst grade. I think in the United States you have a, something similar from 1 to 10. <clears throat> 1 here is the best, so uh, for example, this player got, got the best grade here, and this, this one got the worst. Um, this expert elevation is available um, only after the game, and that it's only a rough summary of, of the, um, uh, the uh, what, what, what the player was really doing during 90 minutes of the game. And um, it's, it's also um, sometimes rather subjective, because it's only one person writing it up. And there are hardcore fans claiming uh, there's one team that always get the good grades and the other teams always get uh, the bad grades. So there's some sub uh, subjectivity to it. Uh, what we have, what, what is more um, ob objective, uh, a lot of pa parameters uh, comparable to the ones we heard um, in, in the morning about uh, American football. Or football. <coughs> For example, uh, the number of ball possessions, the number of tackles won or lost, the number of passes, pass accuracy, and so on and so on. They are like lots of data, and they're very objective. <coughs> they're very fine-grained. The problem is, it's it's hard to to interpret if you if you're not really an expert. You, you get lots of data, and you ask, well, was it a good game? Was it worth it? Was it clear way well? It's it's difficult to decide. And we also thought the others were already using that data. We tried to come up with a new data source, and we thought <coughs> uh, one data source that has not been tapped already is actually a live text match data. For example, you get TV commentary of, of the games, um, you get radio commentary, you, you get on certain web times, uh, websites, you get live tickers explaining what is going on uh, during the game, and you also have social media commentary. And you have different sources of text, and these texts come more or less uh, from people who are experts in, in the field of soccer, and they describe what is, what is happening uh, during the game. And we thought, well, this information is available at the time of the match, and we could use text, uh, text mining approach, get information out of it, and analyze it. That was our idea. Basically, <coughs> take the live soccer match commentary, add some text analytic methods, prepare the data, um, filter the data, make them available for, for further analysis, and then we thought uh, <coughs> we might concentrate on um, the um, performance of, this, uh, of the players. So we use uh, sentiment analysis on this text and try to identify which player are doing something good for the game and which player made a mistake. And just uh, taking the, the text data that is provided to us by different mediums. Um, the advantages would be <coughs> that this could be uh, become automatic. So we, we just uh, have to develop the, the algorithm, basically. And um, then we could do it during the game, which means we could uh, assess the player's performance while the game is in play. We would have about five minutes delay. Um, the data we used to, to uh, find out if this is really is working is from the Configurations Cup, which took place last year, about one year ago, uh, in Russia. Um, it was uh, in June, and there were 16 uh, team, uh, there were eight teams, eight teams. Uh, the, the best teams of every confederation. Uh, FIFA is dividing the world into six uh, areas, uh, for example, South America, Middle America, North America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Oceania. And the best teams uh, come together, plus the uh, champion of uh, the, the, the FIFA World Cup winner and the host country, which was Russia this time. So we had like, eight countries competing, and uh, we had about we had 16 games, um, 12 matches uh, in the uh, group stage, two semifinals, the third place playoff, and the final. And that data we used, and uh, we used that because um, there was a lot of TV commentary available for that. During a regular season, uh, you might get some, 
but for these major events, you get a lot of uh, TV commentary. So um, at the beginning, we, we thought, well, we use all the text information available to us, and then decided to leave some of them out. For example, uh, we, we skipped radio, because uh, it was such a major event that the um, television stations, they paid so much money to um, present the games that the radio stations, they didn't bother really to, to pay money because there was too much competition from, uh, from television. So we skipped the radio. Then we looked at the internet and there are two sources. You have the live tickets on a certain sports website and you have the social media commentary. We looked at the social media commentary and decided not to use it, um, mainly because the quality was very, very widely distributed, <laughs> all sorts of commentary. Um, you get very one-sided commentary because one team has much more, many more supporters than the other team. And also, um, it was difficult for us <laughs> to analyze. Uh, we need to know um, if they are talking about a specific player at a specific time of the game. And this data is not readily available uh, if you use social media. So, so we left that out. What we used were um, sports tickers, and we identified uh, 11 major news outlets, and then looked at their data and said, hey, 11, that's great. Uh, it turned out there were only five, because uh, some of them just used the same source. They have uh, outsourced it and just used uh, the commentary of them. I said, okay, at least we have five tickers for, for every of the match. On television, we have German television, so we, we, everything we did was in, in the German language. And we had Austrian television, which is also broadcasted in, in German. And there were five uh, TV stations, and every TV station, uh, they get several commentators. Um, and they rotate the commentators, make more or less. Where we also um, made sure that we know which commentator was commenting on which game, because there are a lot of differences between the different types of, of commentators. Um, for example, uh, Bela Reti, he, he's very well, a very well known commentator, but sometimes he doesn't like to say very much. There are like, like pauses of several minutes and he's not talking at all, <laughs> just looking at the game. <clears throat> and others uh, uh, use a lot of words, are very emotional, others are not very emotional, so we keep uh, kept track of who is saying what. The basic idea is uh, we have a, we identified a unit of analysis, which is like words or terms, sometimes a couple of words form one, form one term. And uh, we didn't want to use any term, we want to use something that is conveying a positive or a negative um, feeling about a player's action. Um, and if you, if you do a sentiment analysis, this is a familiar concept. And there are a lot of words that are definitely positive and a lot of words that are definitely negative. We could use that, but uh, we, we found out that uh, in soccer you need, also need a specific uh, dictionary because there are some words that don't appear in uh, everyday language and some words have a different meaning than in everyday language. Um, for example, um, we have a very nice expression in, in Germany for, for extremely well-formed pass of the ball, it's called Zahnpass, which is like a cream pass, and this word is only used in soccer. Um, then, uh, in, in, a, in a different context, for example, if you do uh, medical research, the term harmless or harmless is rather positive, in, in soccer it's rather negative, if the pass is harmless, then you don't want to use it. And also, uh, sometimes we get interferences with player names, Bravo is, is some sort of uh, agreement, very, very good thing, but it's also a player name, so you have to take care of <laughs> On the other hand, we don't want to uh, just analyze um, positive or ne negative judgments. We wanted to uh, recognize them only if they're related to players' action, because we want to uh, evaluate the performance of the players. So we needed to have a database of the players, and we needed to tag all the uh, database, uh, the, the players named um, in our data. And there are a lot of players actually. Uh, there are eight teams and more than 250 uh, players who were actually doing something uh, at one point or another. Um, and not only are players mentioned, 
for example, you find here Joachim Löw, which is the uh, the coach of the German national team. He's also really mentioned very often, and we had to take him out because we were only interested in the players. Um, once we define the players, we needed to um, have some idea um, when you're talking about a player, is this uh, a, a positive thing you say about him or is it a negative thing? And we tried several approaches and we tried to analyze the structure of the language and then gave up because in sports commentary you don't get regular sentences very often. Uh, it's a very emotional thing and sometimes you get only part of sentences. At some, part, at some points in time you get only names. It's, it's Müller, Gomez, Müller again. And there's no structure you could analyze. So the most simple and most robust thing we could come up with um, is having a window over the streams of words. For example, uh, this is an example uh, that we translate. Uh, that was naturally a, a grant from Leon Goretzka because his uh, back heel trick was did not lead to something. So we identified the player's name and we had a window, five words before that, five words after that. And if we identify some sort of positive or negative uh, description, we would mark Leon Goretzka with that. It doesn't work 100% all the time, but it was uh, the, the best and most robust method that uh, appeared. Um, and after we've done all that, we need to normalize our, our sources, as you are. Um, because some sources use more words than others and that might uh, change the results if you combine the different sources. For example, the tickers, because they write them, they use fewer words, while in the uh, verbal commentary they use more words. Um, different sources have a different uh, emotionality. Um, on TV, again, it's more emotional than maybe on a ticker. And also, um, not for all games, we had exactly the same information. The Australian, uh, the Austrian television, for example, uh, only provided information uh, for games where Germany was also playing, um, and the different tickers, sometimes uh, two games were uh, happening at the same time, and on the television there was only one live uh, commentary available. So we combined all that, and um, to give you just a rough idea of, of, of the overall data, um, we had about 300,000 words for 16 games from uh, these, these different sources, these 11 different sources, <coughs> and there were about uh, 13,600 mentions of players during that time, um, which is about 33 mentions per game of, of one particular player, but not most of them were not positive or negative, they were just mentioning uh, people. Um, about 1,000 of the mentions were, were negative, about 2,280 were positive, so mostly they were positive commentary, sometimes negative commentary. <clears throat> and you can all, uh, already see that on average, every player is mentioned eight times during a game, uh, doing something good or doing something bad. Um, on average, there are some players that are really named quite a lot, Ronaldo, for example, and other players who are hardly mentioned at all. So you have to take uh, that into account. It depends on the position uh, that you play, on the on the uh, how the game is developing. Sometimes, uh, if you have a very good team and is and is uh, producing lot lots of goals, then their own goalkeeper has hardly to do anything and is not mentioned at all. Um, if, if team is weak, then the goalkeeper will play a central role. Um, if, you, if you look at the 16 games, in blue you see the group phase games, and uh, down below we see um, the finals. Um, we looked how many commentary we would find, and you can see uh, red on the uh, is negative commentary, green is, is positive commentary, and you see much more green than red. But you can also see that there are some games <coughs> where a lot of things are happening, which is an indicator that it's interesting because uh, there are many positive and many negative things going on. And other games, rather 
or, or maybe half of it is only happening. So we try to um, visualize the differences a little bit more. Um, we said, okay, th this is the game where most emotional accounting is happening. This would be like 100%. This is the game uh, that was least interesting, that would be 0%. And in the middle, you could find, okay, this is a regular game. If you're, if you're below that line, it's not such an interesting game. If you're above that line, it's probably a very exciting game. And you can see from this, uh, of the 16 games, five were really noteworthy. Um, about six, five or six were average, and about five or six again, were just uh, you probably wouldn't have missed not watching them. Um, Michael will uh, show you now um, data from two games that we picked and that we analyzed in, in detail. One is uh, Germany against Chile. Um, which happened during the uh, group phase and actually it was a, some kind of uh, accident that these two teams met again in the final and they played again and actually two very different games resulted from that. Thank you. So we have to hurry up a bit but um, let's have a look at the two games. Um, first game is German Chile, so the group stage. Before we look at the possible visualization of the data, we have um, we have used a small legend of the display. So we have uh, the the field here in the background, and these are the um, different positions where the goalkeeper of Chile, the defense of Chile, German forward, Chile midfield. German midfield, Chile forward, German defense, and the German goalkeeper. So, as Uwe already said, we are looking at uh, time slots of five minutes. So here in the upper right, you can see the minutes we are in at the moment. We have um, a trend position here in this uh, diagrams, which is not only the five minutes slot you can see here, but also uh, an aggregated view of the whole game. And this is for the five minutes slot again, you can see the player performance, the top player of this five minutes, and the flop player of the five minutes. And <coughs> in the lower right, you can see, see the aggregated emotions, uh, not based on the team or on any position of the teams, but in total um, the emotions that are mentioned in this five minute slot and aggregated in the total game. So let's go into the data. First five minutes of the game, Chile versus Germany. Not much has happened. Uh, a little bit in the German defense, a little bit in the German midfield. We have a top player who was not that top. You can see the um, screen area is not that big. And also a flop player which was not that important. Let's go farther. Here in the um, seventh minute, I think uh, the first goal, no, six minutes. Um, first goal by Alexis Sanchez, and you can see that this was not that well done by Alexis Sanchez, but it's more in fault by the German defense. And you can see it here, the player who has done this uh, fault was Mustafi. Let's go farther, 10 to 15 minutes. Interesting game, lots of emotions, but nothing happens. Uh, not that interesting. Fault by Ter Stegen, the goalkeeper of Germany. Then we are in the 25 to 30 minutes, and you can see this is the first time ever an emotional mention of the Chinese defense was done. So um, Chile was much better uh, at this game than Germany, and um, there are no many mentions of the Chinese defense until now. So again, a mistake by Leon Goretzka this time. That was a goal by Germany and it was not a fault by the defense of Chile. You can see Chile has done well, but um, the forward of Germany has done a goal. Nothing happens. Very unemotional moment. <laughs> A little bit more interesting. 
mistake by Atul Vidal. Here you can see we have um, Mustafi as well as top player and also as a flop player, so he has done a mistake, but he was also good in this five minutes slot. Not that interesting. And we are near the end of the game, so nothing happens. One to one, enough for both games, uh, both teams. And that's it. So, at the end of a, a match, we can look at an aggregate view of it. So, on the left side, you can see the player performance. Um, best player was Emre Can, second player, Niklas Süle, third player, Alexis Sanchez. And there's a FIFA um, player of the match at the end of the game, and this was Alexis Sanchez. So, you can see we have a little bias of uh, German commentators. They see German players in the front, but um, Alexis Sanchez is not that far away on position 3. We have um, the total emotionality of the game um, that was not that high at this match. We have the emotion totals um, by this 5 minute blocks and we can compare the two teams, Chile in orange and Germany in blue over the time. So this is our, uh, the first match that look at the final same teams, but different position. Last time it was Germany against Chile, now it's Chile uh, Germany, so the positions are switched. The rest is the same. And we can go through it faster. Again, very emotional moment um, of the game in this slot here, 10 to 15, but nothing has happened. Nothing countable has happened, so goal for Germany, mistake by Shalin Whitfield, mostly by Marcelo Diaz, and last Stinde, the goal was done by him. Again, very unemotional moment of the game, but it's passed over. Much of emotions. No. And that's it again. And you can see the emotionality is much higher at this game. Again, here in the five minute slots. And you can also see the two different teams. We can compare these two matches on one slide. Um, here again, the emotionality. You can see it's much more emotional, the final, than uh, the group match. Um, you can see that these. Um, Peaks are higher than, than on this game, and you can also see that there are uh, typical moments where the emotions are higher than on other parts of the game. Okay, to, to, to wrap up, um, we looked at the data, actually we, we started with the player performance, and by accident, identified that emotions are also play a very, very important role which we could analyze. And we, we would like <coughs> to automate uh, what we have done. Actually, it was a lot of uh, work, but now we have uh, all the data and the methods so we can actually write algorithms so it's done in, in real time. We would like to uh, reduce the time lag. Now we have five minutes, we might, might be able to get down maybe to, to two minutes. <clears throat> and uh, also we would like to identify biases because some commentators uh, see a different game obviously than other commentators and uh, it's interesting to find out <coughs> if, if this is possible uh, because we are taking into account several sources we get a more objective view than if you only if you uh, only look at one commentator uh, also, uh, visualization is something that we uh, have to look into, uh, especially as we were presenting this talk. Uh, we were talking about how would we visualize certain aspects that we analyzed, and we're not satisfied with that, and we need to find out what is easily understandable uh, by, by the people and what is not as understandable. Um, and we, we only used emotional data if they were related to a player's performance, but there are a lot of emotional data going on during the game. 
which is related to the referee, which is related to the coach, which is related to the, uh, to the audience. <clears throat> and this is also interesting if you, if you want, to, want to watch an interesting game. Uh, all these emotions play a certain role and we left it out for the moment and we would like to include them uh, in our next research. <clears throat> Some possible commercial applications of this. Um, we can provide additional performance measures for players uh, for example, a commentator score, which is like uh, how good did the player in the, in the eyes of a commentator actually perform, um, an importance for the match, and an importance of the player for the team. Uh, sometimes a uh, team is, is very poorly, but one person is, is very important for that. <clears throat> and this is mainly targeted to, uh, to media and fans, and we can provide it live during the match, and maybe aggregate it uh, after the match. And this is an example of how it could look like. Uh, another option would be, um, especially in the German football league, soccer league, uh, on Saturdays there are several matches taking place at the same time, around like five or six matches at the same time. And sometimes it's difficult to decide which match should you pay attention to right now. And uh, we could provide a dashboard for all the different matches taking place at the same time and you can actually see if it's blue then nothing really much is happening right now yellow is, is more interesting and red it's, it's really hot game right now you might identify well, okay this is the game I should watch right now while uh, this game maybe was interesting in the beginning but now nothing really is happening okay uh, this is our research pipeline, we don't want to go uh, into the details, but would like to thank you, or say vielen Dank. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, uh, the 1.30, the scheduled 1.30 talking here, Chase was not able to make it, okay, so there will not be a talking here for the next 30 minutes, so I'd encourage you to either go next door and watch Kyle Allen's talk, or stick around and talk to these two gentlemen if you have questions right now. So again, we'll be back in here at 2 with Adam Grossman, uh, but the 1.30's talk, uh, Chase Trippi, uh, is, is not on right now. Okay, thanks. Thank you.